Ace, thanks for joining us on the podcast today. Yeah, you're welcome. Happy to be here. Yeah. So it's been about a year since you and I had our first conversation on the phone. Do you remember uh, that conversation very much? Um, yeah, I, yeah, I, I kind of do. Um, it was basically a, a, it was about a week after I had gotten back from a swim race and I had already started thinking about, you know, calendar year 2022 and, and what that would look like and, and how strength training could maybe fit into that, to, into that model, uh, for, for 2022. So, you know, now that you say that it kind of re, you know, kind of re-kicked my memory there. It has been, you know, a little over a year. Yeah. And I remember uh, it was cool to me because you, you described yourself as never done strength training, you know, outside of some boot camp classes, you said, Hey, I'm pretty weak. I can't do a pull up, maybe a few pushups. Talk us through in your mind, you know, people that, that aren't good at something, they usually try to stay away from that. Right. But you like ran into, you're like, Hey, I'm not good at this. I need to actually lean into this, into my training. Can you talk about that thought process that even led you to get the call with me? Yeah, I think if I remember correctly, I was coming back from uh, Minnesota. I had like a, a 12 hour drive and I had downloaded a bunch of just random podcasts and swimming was one of those categories. And, and it, obviously it was your podcast. And I can't remember what episode or what, maybe it was even on YouTube that I had downloaded. And you'd kind of gone through like a prerequisite of you know, if you're a male or a, or a junior or a female, you should be able to do X, Y, and Z. And it was kind of a head snap moment <laughs> where I was like, well, not only can I not do that, I probably can't even get, you know, register any of that to even test. Like I had never done any kind of strength training and I had kind of reached a, a, a situation where I'd, I'd plateaued in swimming. Mm. Um, and I was like looking for an opportunity to find some extra speed, you know, that extra 10% or that 15%. And I was like, well, I know I can't do this stuff, so it's not going to harm me to try it. So why not, you know, go full steam and, and kind of look into this program. So and I remember too that you had even talked about you had hired someone to look at your swimming technique locally. I think it was so like you 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 were really trying to like squeeze out as much as you could. And I remember you saying like you felt like you kind of hit the the peak of what you were going to gain in terms of technique. And I think a lot of people don't think about it that way. Hayes is kind of an either or thing or, or a combination thing. They think, oh, I need to get better at swimming, right? So I just it's all technique based, and it can't be anything related to swimming. What do you remember or how that seed was planted? Like, hey, I've done the technique stuff. I've gone down that road. Maybe strength is the missing piece here. Yeah. So I, I swam in high school. Um, mm -hmm. I was a below average high school swimmer. So I was never our, our lead swimmer in, in any event. I was always like the two or the number three. And, you know, I then I kind of went into triathlon and I was kind of a front of the pack triathlon swimmer, you know, kind of that Ironman swim of 103, 105, a pretty good age group swimmer. And I would always be on these message boards and being like, I'm looking to get a little bit faster. I want to squeeze out a couple more minutes. Mm. And everyone would be like, oh, go get videotaped, underwater videotaping, underwater videotaping. And I did that probably three or four times. And it kind of got to the point where they were like, well, make this very minor adjustment in your catch. Mm -hmm. And I felt like they were just kind of giving me something to give me. You know, like they didn't want to like, you know, if you're paying some money, you don't want someone to say you're fine. You know, they looks were looking, great. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, you know, it'd be like maybe squeeze your legs a little bit here or, you know, start your catch a little earlier. And it just I was like, OK, so it's not form like I'm fine mm -hmm. on form. You know, you can only swim so much as an adult. You know, you have life responsibilities. Mm hmm. So, you know, you're checking off that box. I'm not going to be able to swim 30K a week on a regular basis. So what's left? And it was strength training. And I felt like, and that kind of gets back to that resonating with you, you know, in those podcasts talking about kind of the minimum requirements for, for mm -hmm. a male athlete. And I'm like, well, I can't do any of that. So let's get going. <laughs> <laughs> and and Hayes, so you had a background in Ironman 
And now yep. you're shifting your focus to just swimming and you, you were staying in the open water competition too. So we're talking about yep. miles and miles of races. We're not talking about a 50 free here. Talk a little bit more about the events you were looking to train for and ended up doing. Yeah. So um, originally I was going to swim across Lake Tahoe, um, kind of had a bad summer with life and everything and kind of had to push that to the side. And I really focused on, um, there's a, a five mile race down in St. Croix mm -hmm. and it's, it's my favorite event. I've done it twice before. So this year would have been the, is the third time that I did it. And it's always circled on my calendar. It's a, it's a beautiful Island. It's an amazing race. It's a, it's a two mile ocean crossing and then a three mile coastal. Um, and I was like, you know, if I could just pick up a little bit of time here and there on a per hundred basis, yeah. If you can extrapolate that over five miles, you're kind of looking at some real time here, you know, versus a pool where every tenth tenth of a second counts. You know, I'm looking for minutes. So, um, you know, well, that's hey, that's why I talk when when distance swimmers come to us in particular. I say, hey, I think you can probably gain even more sometimes than sprinters and especially we're talking someone like you open water like you said if we just get you a, a minutia a little better right yeah. in your hundred doing pool swimming how much more is that going to help when you're doing five ten twelve mile swims yeah and i and i found that it really helped the last mile mm. um that last mile is really when historically i was still swimming fine but you kind of crack Mm -hmm. And once you crack, you don't come back from that. <laughs> so you're, you're, you're dropping. Can you describe elbow. that feeling haze for those that haven't done a five or 10 mile race in yeah, open water? It, it's kind of, it's not like right away. It doesn't just, you go from, it's not like a light switch. Um, it starts to kind of build. And at some point your body just decides, I really don't want to swim at this pace in this effort anymore. And in your mind, you kind of go through this process. Well, I still got another hour left or I got another <laughs> 30 minutes left. So now you're just going through the motions. I call it lazy swimming. Um, you drop your elbow. You're not rotating. You're just going through the motions to get it done. And when that happens, it's really tough to bring it back. It's kind of a combination of both physical and mental. So mm. it's hard to bring it back when it happens. So you're yeah, and, and basically that trying to just delay that. I was just gonna say it just is like this gradual decline, right? Where you just feel like and, and you almost probably feel like I'm trying harder, but you're having to try harder just to maintain, if not just slowly receding. And it's just kind of a slow death to the finish line there. Yes, yes. So that that's a that's a great description. You you turn that final buoy and you just want to be done versus like, oh, this is my last five minutes. Let's really, you know, <laughs> yeah. give it all I got. There is no I I there is no that's all I got. Your speed is your speed. <laughs> Mm -hmm. um, so that was really my goal or one of my goals was to really elongate that period where I could still swim hard and swim with good rotation and good elbow cat, you know, good, you know, early vertical form and all that stuff, you know, keeping that form for as long as possible mm -hmm. or, uh, you know, kind of things start to break down. And I remember too, Hayes, that you had some injuries in the past that you were kind of having to deal with or kind of maneuver around. Talk a little bit about that and then how that looked like going into your training, because it, it did affect your swimming training too, like the stuff you were dealing with that you weren't able to train as hard or as frequently, I think, if I remember right. Yeah, yeah. So um, I think it was 2014, 2015, um, I had kind of given up on the Ironman racing um, just completely burned out in that aspect of my life. And I picked up bike racing and basically had a really bad cycling crash. So, um, you know, a, a plate in my clavicle now and had to have hip surgery for a resurfacing of the hip and repair some stuff in there. And, you know, during that, the doctors kind of said, you know, you're probably not going to get to that point of where you were. Mm. Um, you know, we're kind of focusing on eliminating that daily life pain. Yeah. Um, yeah. Your quality of life. Yeah. At this yeah, point is the more right. important thing than training. Yeah. So, you know, I, I walk a mile into work every day and, and I was hurting. Mm. So now post-surgery and post rehab, you know, I can walk miles and miles, but I can never really get to that point of running or cycling again, like I wanted to. Um, so we kind of had to navigate those things. So, so some of those things still crop up, 
Um, you know, when, when my hip gets really tight, it impacts, you know, my swimming in some ways, because my mm. knee gets really tight in the back of my knee and I can't push off the wall like I want to. Um, there's some mobility issues in the shoulder around that plate, you know, in the clavicle. So, you know, we were kind of always navigating some of those issues. So we really focused on periods of mobility as well. Mm -hmm. you know, in the back of the shoulder, making sure everything, you know, that scapula, you know, you hit on this in all your webinars, making sure that scapula had, you know, good range of motion and things like that. And I remember too, when in our first conversation, uh, you asked a pretty direct question of, hey, you know, I'm a middle-aged guy and I see a lot of things of like you talking about club swimmers or 15 year olds, like, is this program going to work for, for someone like me? And especially with that background uh, of pain and having to deal with injuries and stuff like that. So what was your experience like and, and how did that play out with that? Yeah, so that was, there was definitely an ebb and flow of learning how to incorporate with the coaches the strength training component, dropping that into my swimming. And there was mm -hmm. definitely a lot of learning in the first, I don't know, call it eight weeks, where mm -hmm. you go from doing nothing in the gym to something. <laughs> that's, that's a big adjustment. Yes. That's a big adjustment, especially if you've never gone through that stuff. There's a lot of learning to, that takes place there, not only with yourself, but also interacting with the coaches. So mm -hmm. there was definitely a lot of this is way too much and then this is not enough. And you're mm -hmm. trying to always find that balance of not blowing up your week by going crazy on a Monday and impacting your swim on a Thursday. You know, that's the stuff that I, I learned very quickly that if the program said to do this, do that. And even though if you're feeling like a rock star, don't do an extra set. Because it's hey, so are you impact. saying that an Ironman athlete was trying to do more than they were yeah. supposed to? This yeah, is <laughs> yeah, it's kind of built in that, uh, you know, do more, do more, do more, do more. But really, I was learning, let's just do what we're told. And, <laughs> and also sometimes do less. Mm. You know, if you if I had a big weekend of, a, you know, a session in the gym, and maybe a, you know, 6k or a 7k swim workout, Monday, you're not always feeling chipper. And mm -hmm, if, mm -hmm. you know, if the workout said this and you're not feeling it, tone it back a little bit, because again, you don't want to dynamite your week, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and all of a sudden now you're taking three days off just to recuperate. So there was a lot of kind of learning in, in the big and um, in the beginning of what I could do and what I could not do. Is this a huge mind shift that you just described there? Talk to listeners right now that maybe are in that same mindset of whether they're an Ironman athlete or not, or just in the sense of like, I got to do more, right? And especially just the culture of swimming, that's kind of baked into it. Can you unravel a little bit more how you went from, you know, hey, I'm going to do as much as I can to yeah. actually, I'm going to do even less because I'm starting to see how it all correlates. Yeah, it took about... I think there was, I'm trying to remember back, it might've been January, February timeframe. And I, you know, I've gotten past that first couple months where your, your body is just adjusting to the new workload. And I was feeling good. Like mm -hmm. in the gym, I was starting to see results mm -hmm. and I was like, oh, let's ramp this up. And I found I had, it was always Wednesday. So I would <laughs> kill it on Monday. <laughs> I'd have a swim on Tuesday, like a threshold type swim on a Tuesday. And Wednesday, my swim was awful. <laughs> like sometimes I couldn't even get through the workout. I would just cut it in half and get out of the pool. Mm. And I knew I could swim 4K. I knew I could swim 3K. So what's going on here? Yeah. And it was because I was doing too much on that Monday workout when I felt really fresh. Mm. And it was just... It took a couple of Wednesdays to be like, to take a step back and be like, why is it Wednesday? Like, what is, is it too much threshold? And it'd be like, no, you're actually dynamiting your week because of Monday. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so mm -hmm. it was really kind of an adjustment period there of sticking to the plan, not doing the extra set, not throwing another plate on the bar, um, just sticking to, sticking to that routine of do the workout, 
don't do more. <laughs> yeah. And I know you worked with, with a few of our dryland certified coaches here. And I think that the first one that you worked with, Sarah, she had an interesting conversation to you, I think, if you can recall about RPE and explaining that to, to newbies in the weight room. Could you kind of explain what RPE is to our listeners and how you were introduced to that concept and thinking about yeah, it? it was, it was actually something that I, I really struggled with because, you know, it's rate of perceived effort and and it was like, I'm very, like my day-to-day -day job is very analytical. Mm. Um, in the pool, you have a time or you have a clock mm -hmm. looking at you. <laughs> um, everything you can get so granular with the data and everything. And what the heck's an 8RPE? What does that mean to me? <laughs> and like, does that mean like the most I can do and walk away? Is that my max? Like, I really struggled with that in the beginning. And it, it's more of like a mindset of versus, you know, looking at a ruler and it shows an inch and you're like, mm -hmm. I need 10 inches. It's more of like kind of a flow on how to walk away from something and getting the desired effect mm. without blowing up. Yeah, I was about no dynamite. <laughs> yeah, no dynamite. That's what we're looking for. And, and it, it, it did take a while to figure that out because some exercises you know, you have a weight in a number of reps. Mm -hmm. Some exercises really aren't conducive to that. And you have to kind of use that RPE schedule. And it took a little bit of time to kind of figure that out and, and have discussions around that. So. so if you were going to give advice to someone else or go back and give advice to yourself, right, a year ago, what, what's your quick couple minute synopsis of how to think about that? If someone has never even thought about, oh, what, what is RPE in the weight room? Yeah. And how does that relate to my so, workouts? So I would always, so in hindsight, you know, we kind of talked about doing too much too soon. I would, if you see a number, think whatever you, whatever you're thinking, think less. <laughs> <laughs> and that's really the takeaway that I would have. Like to me, an eight out of a 10 still meant like, eight out of 10. That's hard. Yeah. But, you know, maybe that's, you know, in an RPE scale, that's really not the equivalent. You know, I was thinking of it initially as like a max effort would be like a 10. So mm. an eight's got to be like super hard. Yeah. But really it's, it's not really like that. It's, it's, and also an RPE of eight could be different depending on what block of training you're in. Yeah. So was that also part of the mental transition to Hayes where, you know, the Iron Man mentality of, you know, more, 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 it seems like this is kind of related to where you're not pushing yourself all the way, but then you're probably like, well, I know I improve because I work hard. Right. And so now I'm, I'm maybe not working as hard as I could. So am I going to improve? Is that accurate? That kind of push and pull that maybe yeah, goes on there, a little bit? Yeah. There's definitely that ebb and flow in your mind about, am I doing enough because you know, maybe you didn't see a result this week in the pool, or maybe you haven't moved up on the bench press or something. So you're always mm -hmm. wondering, like, and you really have to zone out. And, you know, I didn't do a great job of this, of, of documenting all my lifts every week and, and stuff. But when you really zone out, that's when you see the improvement. You may not see mm -hmm. it day to day and week to week, but quarter over quarter, you will definitely see improvements. Was there a process that you did or, or narrowed in to help you focus on the bigger picture and be able to see that? You know, I kind of, I thought about the lifts within. So like if we were doing a set of like six by five on the bench press or something, mm -hmm. I would always think about what did that feel like last week? So within mm. the set, you know, maybe on set four, did that fifth rep come up really easy or did we struggle a little bit? And that's really what I was kind of thinking about more versus the actual weight itself. You know, oh, I didn't move up this week or I didn't move up this on, on sets. But that's how I would think about it. And just to give you like, you know, one data point, when I started, you know, my max bench was 95 pounds. Mm -hmm. And by the end, I was doing 10 and 12 reps of 95 pounds as my first set warm up. So there's so when you really zoom out you can see that but if I would have tracked that on the daily basis you're like well I'm not getting strong enough fast enough. <laughs> but when you take a step back you're like okay I actually got got a lot stronger, you know.
Yeah, and Hayes, that almost plays into, I know sometimes a lot of frustration, especially with new uh, athletes that are coming to us is, you know, th this this thing about variety, right? Like I want it to be different. I want it to be different. Well, if there's so much variety, you couldn't be able to track things like that. And, and that's part of that balance of the programming, right? You do want, you don't want to do the same thing for a year in a row, right? Because not only are you going to get bored mentally, you're going to get less results in terms of the more you do it. But on the other hand, like you said, being able to zoom out on a quarterly basis or a little bit more, you have to be doing the same stuff on some level to see the improvement. Yeah, when when I was working with the coaches early on, there was a lot of new new uh, lifts and new moves and, and things like that. And we kind of settled on this core group um, because I was one of those people that I didn't know a lot of the movements, so I had to learn them. Mm. And I didn't want to be in the gym watching the YouTube videos for like every type of movement. So we really settled on kind of a core group of 15 to 20 movements and, and yeah. lifts and and kind of worked around those and then we'd we'd add a couple ancillary moves you know here and there depending on on where I was in the season and that's really how I was able to kind of figure out or really zoom out and see those results versus you know like you never do a deadlift and now we're doing a deadlift you know did I get stronger I don't know we only did it three <laughs> times but we did it all year so, so, you know, those core movements, you can kind of track and then add in the ancillary movements when you need to work on something very specific. So. Yeah. So especially I'm thinking of a, a newer listener, maybe to this podcast, Hayes, like yourself, they're on a trip, they're downloading a bunch of podcasts and they get to this one. And they're like, wait a second. So this coach isn't with you. Hayes, you don't know a lot. You're going into the gym. How did this work? How, how, did, how did you learn movements and, and actually improve? Like talk to them about the process a little bit from your end. Yeah, so within the program, there's essentially a video demonstration of every move. So if you're on top of things, you watch those ahead of the session. <laughs> if you're like me, you watch them, you know, five minutes before or actually in the gym. So I don't recommend that route. But um, each workout has a, you know, a, a written description, and then there's either a link to an internal video that you've done or one the coaches have done or something on YouTube that's comparable. Um, so you get to see kind of that movement um, in real time if you want, because if you were to talk to a coach and have a coach verbally describe a deadlift, for instance, if you've never been in a gym, that doesn't mean anything to you. I don't even understand what the, you know, what does that mean? What are you talking about? You have to visually see that. And since they're not standing next to you, you know, a video demonstration is really the best way to go versus just winging it. Um, mm -hmm. Don't, you know, obviously don't wing any kind of movement. You need to see that, that, uh, that movement. And oftentimes I would start like when I was learning, like I hadn't squatted before. So oh, the wow. first few, yeah. So the first few squats, um, I tried without the bar and then I tried just the bar before you put any load on that bar. So you can mm -hmm. really think about the movement without your body having to think about, Oh, I have, you know, 150 pounds on my, on my back. And I think really taking things slow in the beginning and learning those movements is very helpful. Um, almost mandatory, you know, thinking about it. You want to be able to do those things well before you put load on the bar, because that's when injuries are going to happen. If you're, you know, if you're in a situation where you've never done a deadlift and your first time you do it at 150 pounds, <laughs> you know, good things aren't going to happen. You really need to right. get that movement down before you put the load on. So it, it sounds like though it was a success with as much of a beginner and newbie that you were, it, it the process that we have from the assessments, the onboarding, all of that, it sounded like you still felt good about the situation and confident that, okay, this is a progression. I'm feeling yeah. good about how I'm learning. And also, you know, you have the one-on-one -on -one video calls with the coaches and mm -hmm. oftentimes I would describe like, I can't really, I don't feel like my lats are engaged here. Mm. And, you know, Sarah would jump off, you know, take a step back from the Zoom and be like, okay, think about this. And like, she would actually go through um, the movement as well and say, okay, you should probably be feeling this muscle group here. Mm -hmm. And think about squeezing, you know, the bicep here on, on a pull-up or for, you know, things like that. And that really helped too, having those kind of one-on-one -on -one discussions versus, you know, 
you know, just winging it on YouTube or something. Yeah. And I think that's really the power of, you know, sometimes we'll have people that come to us and they think that the Zoom calls are like the live workouts, right? Like I'm going to work out in front of the coach. And I think it's actually more valuable the way we do it where, okay, Hayes, let's talk about like, what are you feeling when you do this? Like, how should you be approaching this exercise? And so like that really helped you, especially as a beginner, understand the concepts of what you need to be focusing on once you go in the gym. Yeah. And just the ability to articulate what you're feeling. Um, mm. because if, if you, if you don't have a lot of experience in a weight room, you know, when we first started pull-ups, I would, I would just feel like nothing's happening. I can't like <laughs> start them. And we had to talk about like, you know, think about engaging here, engaging there. And, and that's actually the dialogue that helps things. It's like having, you know, that, that update call and it's a conversation. It's not like, the calls aren't like, did you do this workout? Did you do this <laughs> workout? It's it's more like um, having a conversation about what happened in the last two weeks or last mm -hmm. month. And then having little sidebars like, okay, let me just demo this really quickly. And be like, oh, I'm actually completely doing that wrong or something, you mm -hmm. know? Um, so those were, you know, those are very helpful. And, you know, I think it's important just not to say yes and no and ask questions. Like, I really like to dig into the science behind, like, why are we doing it this way? Yeah. And it, it wasn't like pushing back and saying what you're doing is wrong. It's more like, I want to understand the big picture and how this is going to impact the whole season. So when you have those update calls, I thought of it as like, you know, an hour, 30 minutes, just to let's have a conversation, you know, mm -hmm. and then you get your workout later. You know, it's mm -hmm. not about really, you do talk about scheduling and things like that, but it was really an opportunity to have like that open dialogue. Yeah. And I'm glad you brought up the collaboration part, Hayes, because I really feel like we put a lot of energy to make sure that's a priority. And it's not just, hey, here's your workout. Good luck. You know, we'll see you in a month or two. You know, I hope it goes well for you. But especially for someone like you, making sure you're understanding and learning it. And I loved how you were just describing it earlier about taking the ownership, like you knew, okay, we just got done with a call. I'm going to have another call in two weeks or so. You have to really take ownership and internalize, you know, how are the workouts going? And, and I think that's really a secret sauce in that you have to take ownership more and more as we go through the program. It's us just not force feeding you, right? Like, and this is where the collaboration and really the success comes from. Yeah. And you have to be honest with that feedback too. Mm. Um, you can't just, you know, you can't, well, I don't, I don't want to use the word lie, but you can't say like, <laughs> oh, the workouts are going great just to appease the coach. Mm -hmm. like they're there mm -hmm. for you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so if something's not working, be honest about that. You know, there was a couple moves that I just didn't like and I wasn't yeah. going to do them. And we'll find, you know, I would tell Sarah, let's find something else that I, <laughs> that I do like, like, yeah, you know, because, you know, I'm not, I'm not here to try and earn a scholarship or make nationals. Right you know, this is a hobby. So I want to make it fun. And that's where the opportunity is to have that dialogue and keep making it fun versus doing, you know, a specific movement that I just don't like. So yeah, you mentioned pull-ups earlier. And I remember on our call, you're like, I've never done a pull-up ever. And, and that can be a hard thing to like build in. How was your progress of doing pull-ups, you know, about a year in or so? Yeah. So we're about, we're almost to one. Oh, yeah. and, that's and, awesome. Hey, yeah. that's legit. Like it legit takes about a year or two to get that first pull up. That's yeah, awesome. Man. And this is coming from the first day where I just, I was hanging on the bar and nothing happens. Like, I don't even know how to start. <laughs> so it's, it was definitely a progress. And that was the one thing that was a little bit, I was kind of down in the dumps for a mm. while. You know, it's like, you see all these gains with the other lifts and the pull-up just takes a long time. Um, and I, it I, is an all or nothing thing. It, it yeah. is, it is a slow progressive and, movement, but go ahead. You know, I would kind of have talks about that with Sarah and, and we would, I'd be like, you know, I, I just don't feel like I'm getting better. And then what actually we, we started to do was the assisted pull-up machine because then I was able to actually track the improvements so, you know, you, when you do an assisted band, you kind of do your reps and maybe you feel a little bit stronger, but when you also incorporate the assisted pull-up machine and now you're taking load off mm -hmm. and you're using, you know, your, your strength more, that was a way to kind of make me feel better during that process that we are making process. 
progress, you know, in that pull up. Um, you know, the other movements I saw gains right away, substantial, but it was just that pull up that uh, was my nemesis. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you're, you're not alone in that, Hayes. But I'm really proud of you for that progress, man. You got you got to keep it up and, and get to that first pull up, man. Get the chin up yeah. there. That's that's going to be a good feeling for sure. In terms of looking at the bigger picture, you know, we just crossed the year mark. What are some big successes you look back? Obviously, in a year, there's ups and downs, sicknesses, successes, things like that. What do you take away the big yeah. picture about a year so, later from starting? So for the anyone listening that's a pool swimmer, <laughs> what I noticed was, um, so I swim in a 25-meter pool, and I would come out of the turns, so I would push off, and I pretty much float my turns. I don't do a lot of underwaters. And I would come up with my head right around the flags. That's kind of where I would resurface. Now I'm basically almost a half a body length past the flat. Oh, wow. So, you know, when you, I mean, that's in a hundred meter swim race, that's, that's a big improvement. Um, so I, I picked up on that um, towards kind of the summer. All of a sudden I just, one day I just kind of noticed, I was like, oh, I'm really surfacing way past where I used to. And so to. it wasn't like you were kicking more haze. You were just getting that much more power, just literally pushing off the wall. Just off the push. Yeah. Just from some of those, um, a lot, I, I can't even remember the names of it. We did some explosive movements, a period of explosive movements. Um, and once we kind of got out of that phase, that's when I really noticed it was almost a half a body length out of the flags. So, you know, in a race of eight turns, that's a, <laughs> that's a lot of time. Um, and then going into St. Croix, so I had my race in the first week of November. Um, I caught COVID in September. Oh. And I basically had long COVID through the middle of October. So I, I couldn't swim more than 2000 meters. It felt like an elephant was on my chest. I continued in the gym. I didn't have any impacts there. So I basically trained for St. Croix off of 2000 meter swims and two weeks of really real training, what I call real training. So right, like a one, after a one, recovering. Yeah, and I basically went into St. Croix under trained and I think I was one minute or two minutes slower than the prior year. So I basically did no training leading up to that race and did an 8,000 meter swim race in worse conditions due to hurricane nicole still kind of lingering in that area so we were getting hit with swells and i finished and i got out of the ocean feeling like i got another 30 minutes in me oh so, wow <laughs> so it was a little bit disappointing to see a slower time but then when i kind of thought about it i was like dude you did not really train for this because of COVID. you were just in the gym in the last couple of weeks you got really back in the pool yeah, so, Hayes, can you even imagine going back two years or so and saying, I'm just not going to train for two months before it and showing up and seeing what would happen? It tells how yeah, much reserve strength you built up over the year, you know, yeah. that it the strength stays with you. And, and people, I think, don't understand that as much as, you know, aerobic capacity can leave you much quicker than strength capacity. And you saw it right there. Absolutely. I, I can't, I remember the first year I did it thinking I couldn't even raise my arms above my head after the first race or the first year I did it. And now I'm basically going into a completely undertrained. I wouldn't really even say I raced it. I went for a five mile swim. Like I knew I wasn't going to be able to race this, you know, it was just, let's have, let's go enjoy a couple hours in the ocean. And I get out of the pool and I'm like, Whoa, <laughs> And everyone was talking about the worst condition, or I got out of the ocean, everyone's talking about the worst conditions, the side swells. And I was like, I kind of feel fine. <laughs> so it, it was really an eye opener after I took a, you know, after 30 minutes and having that first post race beer, I kind of thought about, I was like, dude, you just swam five miles on like three weeks of training. Like, <laughs> In hurricane, so I hurricane yeah, conditions yeah, with, with swells from, from Nicole. So yeah, it was, uh, it was a good day in hindsight. <laughs> so. That's awesome. Yeah, it may not have been the success you were looking for, but in terms of the situation and what you were dealt, it seems like you did as best you could, and your training helped you as much as it could, you know, given the circumstances. Yeah, it, and I think the mobility blocks really kept me 
off the shelf. You know, I was really able to not take a lot of time off because sometimes when you're doing these long weeks of training, your shoulder just really acts up and we really focused yeah. on mobility. So even if you're not quote unquote strength training, the mobility factor is still such a huge element, which I really never considered prior to, to, to working out with you guys. That's a great point, Hayes. And, and describe that in detail a little bit more, especially for someone listening that that's never done mobility, you know, or, or think about that just as a session, right? Because we're not talking about that long of a time commitment. And so I could see how people can easily be like gloss over, oh, that's not going to help that much. Or, you know, it's fine. I'm just going to jump in and get going in my workout here. Yeah. And I think especially as you get older, mobility becomes even more important. But you know, it was, it was like a 20 minute session or a 15 minute session, a session within a session. And you really start working on these little mobility exercises. And all of a sudden those aches and pains the next morning after a long swim kind of go away. Um, so it's a combination of, you know, being stronger, of course, but also emphasizing, making sure everything can move in that full range of motion because what I found is, you know, when you can't, you start altering your stroke a little bit. And now maybe you're not as efficient and you're putting more load on the front of the shoulder or something like that. And really working on mobility lets you swim to your best ability longer. Mm. Um, you're not you're not taking two or three days off every couple of weeks because it hurts to raise your arm above your head. You know, and that's that is so important because you know, over the course of a year, if you do that five or six times, that turns into like three weeks of training that you've just, you can't be in the pool. So, and that's um, not normal, Hayes. It's not normal that you should, after training, you know, feel like I can't lift my arm, like yeah. something's wrong in terms of, yeah. that's not something you should be putting up with on a regular basis. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> and it, like, I get back to, this is a hobby. I don't want to be in pain. <laughs> um, so yeah, it was, it was, it was important, especially in the summer. Um, and leading into the fall, it was, you know, that, that mobility sessions really helped. So that's awesome. And, that, and I, I kind of learned a lot of that, you know, I would attend your webinars that you were mm. doing, you know, in addition to the coaching, because, you know, these are free webinars. So if you're teaching for 45 minutes to an hour with the opportunity to ask questions, why would you not do that? So it's an hour, you know, you do them every couple months or, you know, and it was like, why wouldn't I use this opportunity to, to see the, the newest thinking around mobility? <laughs> and then I would talk to Sarah and Sam about it and be like, yeah, we can incorporate that. And I would describe me as like, and Sarah would be like, oh yeah, Chris really likes that movement. <laughs> and, you know, and, and it was, you know, we were kind of having these discussions about, yeah, we can throw those in. Absolutely. <laughs> and it helps you bring up the, your level of education so that you can kind of articulate this to a coach in a meaningful way. You can really mm -hmm. describe why, you know, exactly what's hurting and where it's hurting. And then they can take that information and build a program around that. So, yeah, I, I know, Hayes, you obviously aren't a, a coach of a team, but that thing that you said right there about raising your level of education and communication, like that's why we've seen so much more success when coaches that get a team with us then become dryland certified because it's like, all right, we're raising the level of what we can actually talk about, right? Similar to where you had to learn almost what you didn't know, right? Like you didn't know what you didn't know. And then once you're starting to learn, now you have better vocabulary for it. Now we have better conversations. Now we have better programming and everything starts small snowballing in a positive direction there. Yeah. I mean, when you start just saying, oh, if you were talking to a coach and say my shoulder hurts, well, that's, <laughs> that could be a thousand things. And it's probably not actually with your shoulder. It's somewhere else downstream <laughs> that's, that's, you know, landing on the shoulder. So to say like, oh, I'm, I'm experiencing a pain or tightness here or, you know, and they can really say, okay, it's probably, we need to calm this muscle down and let's work on kind of, you know, maybe throw in a, a lacrosse ball and work on that section. Let's work on some mobility, you know, in this, this specific movement, because if you just tell a coach or a, a doctor, my shoulder hurts, I mean, that's, mm -hmm you know, a doctor's probably going to default to there's a tear or something. And really that's not the case. Um, it's something probably in, in your back <laughs> or along that, that shoulder blade scapula, yeah. you know, Terry's minor area. 
there's something going on with the little muscle somewhere that's surfacing at the front of the shoulder. So, or maybe it's the training. I can't lift my arm, huh? Maybe something's going on here. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. Hey, I really appreciate the time. And as we're wrapping up here, what would you tell someone if they're in your shoes, you know, loading up on the podcast, they get to this episode, they're thinking about, you know, New Year's coming up right now when we're recording this and thinking, hey, may maybe I need to get a little bit more serious about my strength training and whether they're a pool swimmer or more like you an open water focus, what's your advice to them? Yeah, I would definitely not be scared of the gym. Um, mm -hmm. You know, when I first walked in there, I didn't you know, these guys are moving around big weights and I was starting with, you know, 10 pound plates and things like that. So I would, you know, not, you know, get in there and, and do your thing. Don't compare yourself to others. Go in there with an open mind. So you're dealing with coaches that have been doing this, you know, for the most part for a lifetime and they can walk you through the trials and tribulations, uh, through the highs and the lows. And more importantly is to like, stick to the program don't really deviate or, or get crazy and you know have that dialogue and that feedback it's it's such a great opportunity to really kind of take a holistic approach to swimming swimming is is you know maybe 20 years ago it was just in the pool mm -hmm. well now it's not anymore now we know through the education and the science that you know it's it's about strength and mobility and you have a coach with all these resources that are there for you. Um, so it, it's a great program. I highly recommend it. And I don't think it's something that you do one year and all of a sudden the, you've, you've topped out. Like it, it's a learning experience, just like swimming. Mm -hmm. You know, did you hit your PR in the 100 free on year one? Probably not. You know, the, you know, you can start stacking years of this stuff on now. Mm. And you know, for, for maybe some of the older swimmers, you know, strength training is important for quality of life down the road. So, you know, there's other benefits outside the pool and outside the ocean. Um, just, you know, daily life, you're going to be a stronger individual and you're not going to break down as much. That's awesome. Hey, so I want to end it with this. I'll, I'll start a sentence and you finish it for me. Training with surge strength dot, dot, dot for you. Yeah, wow. Um, strength training with with surge strength for me gave me the opportunity to work with a coach, have a regular dialogue, and not overthink or over compartmentalize your training. So it it gives you it gives you the recipe and the method of procedure, and now you get to go in the kitchen and execute on that. And you always have that reinforcement. You always have those weekly, you know, biweekly, monthly tastings to make sure that everything's still working. Um, and it's tweaking. It's constantly tweaking. It's not like here's your program runoff, and we'll talk to you in a few months, and maybe it worked, maybe it didn't. You know, you get that feedback right away. Um, so it, it was it was a great experience. Hayes, just like I would expect any Ironman open water swimmer, you finished strong. I loved it. Thanks so yeah. much for the coming All on. Right. I really appreciate it. It was a pleasure.